Thank you, and thank you for letting me uh, talk with you today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the Mouse Metabolic Phenotyping Centers um, and talk about uh, the services and the kinds of data that get uh, generated. Uh, and so for today's agenda, I thought I would um, first start off by talking about the, the, the MMPC organization, because many of you may not be familiar with the Mouse Metabolic Phenotyping Centers, uh, and it'd be useful to have some uh, frame of reference. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about some of the MMPC services that are available. Um, and I thought it would be interesting uh, to kind of go over the order process a little bit, just to kind of give you an idea of how clients interact with each of the centers and how the experimental designs are developed and things like that. Um, and then we will move into the data curation and data aspects of the kinds of data that are collected uh, in the MMPC. Uh, and we'll follow up that with a, some examples of how to search uh, for data in the MMPC. And then I would finalize it with some uh, future MMPC integrations that we are uh, working with DKNet and the Hypothesis Center to try to uh, use the MMPC data in um, uh, other integrated formats uh, to try to um, uh, move the science forward. So uh, the Mass Metabolic Phenotyping Centers were actually have been around for quite some time. They um, were established back in 2001, um, and then they go through these competing renewals every five years. Uh, during this current five-year funding cycle, there are uh, five uh, mouse metabolic phenotyping centers uh, across the country. Uh, one of them is at the University of uh, California, Davis. Uh, then another is at University of Cincinnati. Uh, we also have one at University of Massachusetts, uh, also at University of Michigan and Vanderbilt University. Uh, my group runs the Ma mouse metabolic phenotyping center coordinating unit. So uh, for the coordinating unit, it's a fairly uh, small group. Uh, I am the director. Um, I'm also helped with this uh, endeavor with Dr. Ashok Sharma, who is our bioinformatics person. Uh, Dr. Nathan Zhu is our biostatistician. Uh, my programmer is Mike Ferro, and he, do, he does all the web development. Uh, Danilo Casello is our network manager, and Kobe Williams is our data curator, and Sarah Gross is our administrator. So. We have a number of activities that we are responsible for. Um, one of them obviously is creating the data schemas to store all the data that's generated by the consortium. Um, and we have tried to also incorporate links from the outside resources to make this a more integrated environment. Um, for interaction with more um, national resources, uh, we built an API so that they can access the underlying data structures without having to actually come to the website, and so these APIs can be incorporated uh, into other websites, for example, if they want to pool our data, um, or, for example, if there is storage and things that needs to be done, uh, data can be automatically downloaded from our site. Uh, we're also in charge of organizing the data curation and data visualization tools for all the data that's generated by the MMPC. Uh, and the main thing that we do is provide the website for the consortium members, the MPC clients, and the public at large. <clears throat> um, we also provide all of the infrastructure for all the different activities that, that are done by the MMPCs. So, for example, um, the MMPC, MMPCs also have some courses that they offer every year. Uh, so, the, the Vanderbilt group offers the mouse uh, uh, glucose clamping in the conscious mouse, as well as a isotope tracer course. And so, for example, we help them with um, the agendas and um, the syllabuses and, and making a platform for them uh, so that they can run their courses through our site. Just as an example. Um, we are also re required to provide support and fiscal oversight for awarding uh, our funding program, which we call the MicroMouse uh, program. And occasionally, um, the uh, MMPC has working groups, and there is uh, uh, that sometimes there's money dedicated to helping these working groups, and we're also charged with providing the support and fiscal oversight for the distribution of funds as dictated by the NIH. Um, for the uh, MMPC uh, consortium at, and at large, we're also uh, charged with developing reports to track business activities. Um, I'm going to get rid of this. Okay. Uh, develop uh, reports to track business activities and core utilization for the MMPC. And also, we heavily try to integrate and coordinate with other external resources, for example, some of the work we're starting to work with, DK 
Net, uh, also the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, and trying to connect our data with other data sets that are out there to try to uh, move the um, science forward. So for uh, each of the centers, they have a number of cores. Um, Patrick So is the director of the University of Cincinnati uh, MMPC Center. And uh, their center has three cores. Uh, their, the first core is focused on lipid, lipoprotein, and glucose metabolism. Uh, the second core they have is the energy metabolism, food intake, and body weight regulation core. Kim is the director of the University of Massachusetts uh, MMPC. Uh, they have seven cores. Um, uh, the first one is the metabolism core. They then have the analytical core, the animal care core, uh, the islet core, cardiovascular core, the human, humanized mice core, and the microbiome core. And you'll, as you as you look at the at centers, you'll notice that some of them have very specific uh, um, specialties. Uh, so, for example, in Cincinnati. Uh, lymphatics is a specialty of that core, and so if you're interested in mouse lymphatics, uh, the University of Cincinnati has a number of services and tests that they can offer to help you uh, phenotype uh, your mice. And so, for example, in Jason Kim's core, they have humanized mouse core, where if you want to use the humanized mouse model, uh, they can help you out with that. Um, so Malcolm Lowe is the director of the University of Michigan, uh, MMPC. Uh, and they have an animal care and germ-free uh, mouse core. They're the only MMPC that has a germ-free uh, mouse core. So if you're interested in notobiotic work, uh, you can work with them uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, they also have a metabolism and a bariatric surgery core and behavior core, uh, the microvascular complications core as well, and they also have a microbiome core. So for the bariatric surgery cores, uh, that overall, there's, uh, there's uh, three sites uh, that do bariatric surgery. So if you're interested in bariatric surgery mouse models, uh, the two types of um, models that they provide, they can do the vertical sleeve gastrectomy as well as the Roux and Y uh, system. And I believe, if I remember correctly, Vanderbilt can also do biliopancreatic diversion uh, if you're uh, interested in malabsorption um, types of models. Uh, Camp Lloyd uh, runs the UC Davis MMPC. They have four cores. <clears throat> the first one is their animal care and surgery and pathology core. Uh, the second one is their endocrinology and metabolism core. Uh, they also have an energy balance exercise and behavior core. And they also have a microbiome and host response core. And then uh, the final uh, one is uh, David Wasserman, who's the director of the Vanderbilt University core. Uh, they have, I mean, MMPC, excuse me. Uh, they have four cores. Uh, they have a metabolic regulation core, a cardiovascular pathophysiology core, uh, the analytical resources, as well as body weight regulation. So you, as you can see from the variations in the cores, there's actually quite a bit of uh, potential uh, uh, services that can be offered from the MMPCs. Uh, and these services uh, are very broad and, and can be uh, classified through a, a number of different types of domains. So if you're looking at endocrine uh, systems, uh, you can look at um, diabetes phenotyping, uh, hormone measurements, uh, insulin and insulin function, or you can look at pancreas, islet, and beta cell function. Uh, if you're interested in cardiovascular complications, uh, a number of these cores can work with vascular function, cardiac function, blood count and chemistry, circulation, microvascular complications. Uh, if you're interested in energy balance, uh, there are a number of cores that deal with body composition and food and water intake, energetics, carbohydrate metabolism, and a, and a whole host of uh, phenotyping services for obese animals. If you're interested in metabolism or metabolomics, uh, there are a number of uh, tests that can be uh, looking at amino acid metabolism, lipid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, energy expenditure, exercise physiology, uh, met and metabolite concentration. Um, if you are interested in gastrointestinal uh, uh, phenotypes, uh, the there's a number of bariatric surgery models, as I said. Uh, there's also a number of cores that deal with the microbiota and the microbiome, fat absorption, lymphatic system, chylomicron metabolism, those kinds of things. Uh, and then for those analytical resources in histology, there are a number of cores that will do immunohistochemistry, histopathology, amino acid uh, metabolism, lipid metabolism, and carbohydrate metabolism. So there's a, there's a broad um, number of services that are offered by the MMPCs. 
And the MMPCs were originally created um, to provide these high quality fee-for-service tests, uh, and they were obviously funded by the NIDDK. Um, and so the idea was that some of these uh, tests are actually quite difficult, and the staff uh, that are staffed in these MMPC centers are extremely good. Uh, they're highly trained and highly qualified in these different types of tests. Uh, and then they could work with clients, uh, even with experimental design issues, to help them come up uh, with uh, a good test for whatever the uh, particular uh, uh, phenotype is that they're looking for. So as I said, one of the main things we do, uh, we had to produce is the MMPC web portal. Um, the web portal really has two sides to it. It has the public face and the private side. Uh, for the public face, uh, we provide communications regarding uh, the different types of announcements, for example, for funding programs and stuff like that, uh, the MMPC meetings and the catalog of services. Uh, we provide information regarding the MMPC's organization, the steering committee and the standing committees, as well as the external advisors, uh, as well as information about each of the different centers that are involved in the uh, MMPC. Uh, and then as far as the public re data repository is concerned, we also provide some analytical tools as well as a variety of ways to um, look for the data that, that you may be uh, interested in. On the private side of things, um, that's mainly uh, for my group and the centers themselves. Uh, the clients do log into the private side, but their, uh, their roles are fairly restricted. Um, it's just their information. Uh, so there's actually a site administration portal as part of the private side. Uh, that we manage for uh, policy enforcement and security roles that we use for our um, for the um, accounts in the system. Uh, the centers use our data submission uh, system uh, to upload mouse strain information or the experimental data for uh, the tests that they're doing, uh, histology images, and they can manage their catalogs on our site uh, because the catalog that we have uh, covers across all five uh, consortia. I mean, all five centers. Um, and so, to make it easier for them, uh, we allow them to manage their, their catalog on our site. And with respect to the data queries, the, really the biggest difference is that the private data that has not been released to the public is accessible to uh, the center staff themselves uh, and the administration, uh, administrative uh, units such as ours. Now, the one policy that is in, in, uh, enacted for the MMPCs is that uh, centers are not allowed to see data or clients from other centers. Uh, so that's why we use a role-based security model. So uh, the University of California Davis can't see the clients or the data uh, from the Vanderbilt University clients and data, for example. So, so this is the, the home page for the MMPC, and you can get to it by going to www.mmpc.org. And the site really orients towards the tests and things like that. However, um, you can quickly get to the data just by clicking uh, these little icons here. Uh, you navigate the site using the uh, menus at the top, um, and that will quickly get you to the various pieces of information or data searches or whatever you want. Uh, to get into the private side, you just click the little login button, uh, and you enter in your username and password, and it, it will take you to the site. Uh, and because we use role-based security, we know uh, what privileges you have on the site when you log in. So we can adjust the look and the options based on your user privileges. And so the site is very dynamic in that sense. So we allow people, uh, for, for example, the center administrator's view is gonna be very different, say, than a client's view. And we also make it easy so clients can get to their orders very quickly, uh, and they can also uh, provide information uh, about how to train and do things and things like that on the site. So as I said, because the MMPC is a fee-for-service organization, the main thing that uh, we deal with is the catalog. And so because people can um, approach the site in a variety of different ways, if you're an experienced client with the MMPC and you know what you want, uh, you can just go straight to the center of the core or a test group area and order the test you need uh, right away. If you're not quite sure what you're looking for, uh, we provide a way where you can look based on the research areas of interest. Um, and if you really, really have a lot of questions, we did build a decision tree uh, interface where uh, a number of questions are posed to you uh, about your phenotype of your mouse model, and then we make suggestions on the types of tests uh, that you might use for that particular model. 
So the current catalog of services contains 564 catalog items, and each center averages about 112 tests uh, that you can have performed. And on average, each center accepts about 60 orders a year. So the, uh, the catalog, the, the default search mode for the catalog is similar to like a Google search. Uh, it's a free text search. You can just click and type in whatever you want, and it will return um, uh, those tests. If you need exact matches, you would use quotes. Um, and this section right here, because the way uh, orders can only go to one center at a time, so if you know where you want to go, you can quickly just click on that center's icon and it will reorient the catalog for that particular center. You can then select whatever tests you want and then it will automatically take you to the order process. Uh, if, however, you want to um, focus in based on research areas of interest or tests, if you click the little link there, it will change the filtering. So if you know the center or the core that you want or the research area of interest or the test number, you can apply these filters very quickly. We also allow you to look from different types of group, test groups. Or if you're looking, for example, tests that are done with blood or serum or plasma, you can just enter the tissue in and it'll show you all the tests uh, that are appropriate for that uh, tissue. So once uh, you've decided what you want, um, the order process, is from the perspective of the coordinating unit is a uh, semi-automated thing. Um, so the client will uh, go into the catalog or straight to the application for services if they know what they want. Uh, and then they can submit this request to uh, the MMPC center. And from this point forward, it's sort of a black box as far as the coordinating unit is concerned because each center has their own um, way of processing their orders and they have their own policies internal to their institution on how they handle uh, animals, for example, uh, or samples that come into the system. And so what will happen is the order will go to the center, the center will be notified, uh, they will then contact the client, and then usually a conversation uh, between the client and the center goes on uh, where they describe what it is they need the center to do, uh, experimental design issues, and they will, they will work with the client uh, to uh, design and help them work with, their, with the particular phenotype that they're interested in and if they have suggestions on how to make the experiment of design better, uh, they will also help them out through that. Uh, but at some point, uh, the center is going to either accept or reject uh, the order. Uh, if they accept that, that automatically updates our system that the order has been accepted. And then it just goes into their, the, the local MMPC center's process, and they will process the order and work with the client offline relative to the coordinating unit. And so, that they will work and then at some point uh, the order will be completed and the center will come back to our site uh, and mark that as complete and then that just tells us that we are expecting them to upload the data into our system uh, and then that kicks off a series of processes in the coordinating unit once data is uploaded. Uh, the order and the application for services is actually fairly straightforward so when a when a client uh, logs in, uh, they are presented with the client area and they can just click the application for services. Uh, it brings up the little uh, tab format. Uh, the first tab is really just general information. Uh, it automatically fills in for you uh, since you're logged in. Uh, however, it's not unusual for students or postdocs to be sending orders for their principal, uh, principal investigators. So we provide a place for uh, them to enter the principal investigator's name uh, because we may need to contact them for uh, uh, for um, uh, analysis purposes or phenotyping and things like that. Uh, if you're going to send live animals uh, to the centers, then we need to know your veterinary information. Um, then you just select the center that the order is going to go to, what, what's the rough timeline that you're going to want your uh, data completed, and then your source of funding. Um, the next tab is the details tab, and this is where we kind of gather uh, more detailed information of exactly what it is you're going to send us and what it is you're looking at. And so, uh, are you sending us live mice? Are you sending us tissues? Or are you sending us DNA, for example, if you're doing microbiome work? Um, how many of those uh, samples will you be sending us? Uh, what are the age of the animals, their genders? Uh, if you have diet-specific information that you need us to be aware of, you can enter that as well as well as the genetic manipulations of the animal uh, that they're going to be phenotyping, and as well as the um, uh, baseline phenotypic information that you already know about uh, the animal. So um, kind of gives them an idea of what potential questions they might ask a client uh, to help them out with their experiments. 
So uh, once that information is entered, you then go to the services tab and you just tell us what it is you need them to do. Uh, in this case, it's in uh, IGTT, uh, a, a germ plasma glucose, and an H1C, H -A, uh, HbA1C. And then the final thing is the conditions of use agreement. Uh, so this, uh, about, I don't know, seven to eight years ago, this um, it, uh, replaced material transfer agreements. And it's essentially a conditions of use telling you that uh, the intellectual property is maintained by the institution and the client and the MMPC has no ownership over any of that. Uh, and also in this conditions of use, uh, the client is agreeing that they will uh, upload the, that they will allow the center to upload the data into the national resource and then at some point in the future it will be released to the public. And so, um, Not every institution allows investigators to um, uh, to authorize that and so we allow we have the ability that um, if they are not they can just say they're not authorized and they can send a unique hyperlink uh, to the administrator in their uh, institution. If they send them that link then they can review the conditions of use and accept or not. Okay, so what kind of data do we collect? We collect a lot of different types of data, not just metabolic phenotyping. Uh, but actually, one of the most popular things that people are looking for on our site are protocols. Uh, and so we continue to work with different centers to uh, add protocols into our system. Uh, currently, the five centers have submitted a number of protocols uh, into our national resource. And one of, the one, one of the things we wanna make sure is that these protocols are available as to as many people as possible. So we have uploaded and ported all of the uh, MMPC protocols into the protocols.io website. Uh, we've uploaded 218 different protocols. And the nice thing about this is they're assigned a document object identifiers or DOIs. So they will be maintained in this resource for forever, basically, uh, for as long as the protocols.io is available. And these are, these are DOIs so that they can be used in manuscripts, for example, if you want to reference a particular protocol, you can add that DOI as part of the reference. Now, because we're dealing with clients, they don't always use standard laboratory strains. Uh, many of them are uh, strains that are created in their laboratories. Uh, so we uh, incorporate strain information into the uh, system. Uh, we use the international nomenclature rules uh, for naming your strains. Uh, we also try to um, capture basic breeding information and parentage if we can, uh, also how it was created, uh, any kind of allelic or genomic uh, um, alterations, um, that is all captured as well. Um, and the phenotype is for each of these strains is actually derived from the data that's been uploaded. So, so just to kind of give you an idea, here's a double, uh, a double knockout. Uh, each of the strains has an official name and a common name. Uh, it has a description, uh, the investigator uh, who is associated with that. Here is the uh, genomic information. Um, so this was a knockout on both alleles for, this, uh, for these two genes. Uh, these are hyperlinks to the NCBI Entree Gene ID system. And you can see this particular strain has been used in two different experiments uh, in the system. So when, uh, these, when the MMPC centers uh, do their tests, what they're doing is actually capturing measurements for a number of assays, okay? And so uh, assays in our system can be both quantitative and qualitative. And as far as we're concerned, we consider quantitative measurements anything that is a number, essentially. Um, qualitative measurements uh, tend to be categorical types of things. So for example, uh, you may have an assay called lymphocytic infiltration with only two possible values present in absence. Um, or you may have an assay that has plus, plus, plus versus minus, minus, minus as its uh, valid outcomes. So we can capture both types of data in our system. Uh, we try very hard to standardize the assay names and groupings across the different centers because each center might have a slightly different name for each of the different assays. And so we work hard with the centers to make sure that we unify that as best as we can. Uh, the assays also have min and max ranges that we use for data curation and data error checking. Um, and then we also have the units of measure and how the data was captured. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, this is a time and platform border zone uh, assay. Um, it's a cognitive function assay. Uh, the abbreviation is time and zone, the inner measure is seconds, and it has a range between zero and 90. And here's a brief description, and here's the protocol associated with that. 
And then we have a group so that people can search for these things based on the kinds of assays that they're looking for. So in this case, it's a cognitive function assay. Okay. So experiments are how we capture data and present it to the, to the outside world. So any data that is uploaded into our system has to be uploaded into an experiment. And these experiments are identified by a title and a description so we can kind of capture what was done. Uh, we can also optionally sign experimental conditions. These are the independent variables. So for example, a mouse diet or a drug uh, or a surgical procedure or anything like that. Um, and then for the animals themselves, we make sure we, uh, we identify the sex, the strain, the age, and a unique identifier that's unique to the client. So that way uh, we can track uh, these animals across multiple cores, for example. So you may have one core uh, doing one set of tests, another core doing another set of tests, but we can link all that data together in our system because of the unique animal ID. Okay. We also capture the age of the animal when, it was, when the sample was obtained, and we also, uh, as I said, uh, can assign uh, experimental conditions. Now, the policy for the MMPC for any data that's been uploaded into the system is it will be released to the public if one of two things happens. Uh, if the data is published, um, then it can be released to the public, or if the data has been sitting in our system for two years. And so the way that works is two weeks before the data is uh, uh, destined to be released, um, we send an email, the system will send out an email to that client letting them know that their data is about to be released, and if they need us to hold off, so for example, they may be in the middle of a publication and we, they don't want to release the data to the public yet, uh, they just need to email us back and we will add an additional time onto the release uh, to, to give them time to do whatever it is they need to do. So and we're very flexible with that. Um, it, it doesn't happen as often. I'd probably say maybe about anywhere between five to 7% of the time, uh, we'll get, someone will ask us to hold off and that, that it, it's done automatically. The other thing is we use experiments to let the senders have a way to, to um, uh, give their data to their clients. And so you can attach documents to these experiments and they can use the interface to actually send the data to their client. So I know this is very small, but this is an example of an experiment page. Uh, at the top, we have, as I said, the title, uh, the investigator, and a description of what was done, its status, when it will be released to the public, uh, the animal age uh, that is used, is in this case, the animal unit is uh, in weeks. Uh, and then we have a little table up here at the top that allows you to kind of, at a bird's eye view, see what's in this particular experiment. And each of these hyperlinks is, will take you down to that section within, within the experiment. So for example, you can see for this particular experiment, we had 24 animals, uh, three experimental conditions, and we measured seven different things, and there's 164 measurements in the system as well as five documents. Okay, and so if we just look down here, we can see for the animals, uh, we had, these were 24 C57 black six females that were phenotyped in this particular experiment. Uh, and the experimental condition that they were uh, under was a surgical procedure where they were doing uh, bone fracture uh, tests. And so these are the different um, categorical values that are uh, possible in the experiment. And these are the measurements that were taken for these 24 animals. Um, and that this is the data that was uploaded by the center. That's the uh, data. This is the raw uh, data, uh, and as, as well as potentially uh, the analysis of the data that they send out to the client. Now, the client has full control over whether they want to release that portion to the public. So if they want to, they can just edit whatever they want. And when the data gets released to the public, Whatever documents they say they want to have the public visible, uh, they can let the public have that data if they want to. Uh, so the documents are secure unless the, unless the client wants them to be released. Uh, if the, when the center has uploaded their documents, it's very simple for them. They click this little icon here, a little email pops up with hyperlinks for them to download their data. They can add a little bit of custom text, and then they can just send the email off to the client, and then the client can download their data at their leisure. Um, these are the million phenotype terms that have been associated with this, and I will talk in a couple minutes about how those are generated and how they're used in our system. Okay, so you can imagine, because the MMPC, these, these clients, the data that were, that's being uh, accumulated in the, in the MMPC is very heterogeneous. It's, this is a very unlike most consortia at the, at the NIH 
uh, where there are usually defined protocols, very specific animals are being uh, phenotyped, and the data is collected in a very specific manner. Um, so, for example, the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, uh, who's in charge of the Knockout Mouse Project, they have a very defined 16-week protocol with a very specific number of ma uh, male and female mice. And so when the data is collected, it's collected in a very specific fashion. Here, it's basically whatever the clients are doing in their laboratory. So it could be a bariatric surgery model, or it could be um, looking at a drug effect or a diet effect. Um, and it's very, very variable. And so uh, for us, we need to make sure that when the data gets uploaded, that we have confidence that it's uploaded it's correct and that we have um, um, as much metadata as possible so that the data can be interpreted in the future. So we built a data curation workflow to try to manage that process. And so when a center marks our experiment as complete, they're telling us they've uploaded all the data they're going to upload for that particular experiment. It then sets off a, um, an automated script that runs on the data set uh, and signs these what we call curation flags. Uh, it then inserts a record into our system, a data, database curation record, uh, so that our curator knows that there is a pending uh, data set that needs to be curated. It also emails the data curator to let them know that there's a data set ready. Uh, and then that begins the process. And so the data curator will start looking more carefully at the data that's being uploaded and try to make sure that it is as complete as possible. And so uh, for the automated script, the things that we kind of look for, we look for experiments that have only experiment or control animals, um, that's a flag, uh, because we need at least both control and experiments, otherwise we can't necessarily uh, analyze the data or understand it. And so if there's only experiment or only controls, uh, it will the, the curator will notify the center and just make sure uh, is that what they wanted to do. Uh, experiments where the strains are the same for both experiment and control animals could be very legitimate. So for example, if they were looking at a diet effect, the strains might be the same, uh, but it could have been done by accident, and it's something that the, the, the center may have just forgotten. So they will notify the center and just ask them, uh, is this correct? Uh, experiments where all the metadata fields for the experiment and control are the same. So what's distinguishing the experimental group from the control group? Because as far as we can tell, everything looks like they're identical as far as how they were treated. Uh, experiments where the number of animals in the order is different from the number of animals in the experiment. Uh, so, for example, the order said they were going to send them 20 animals, but only 12 animals worth of data were uploaded. And the, the client could have only sent 12 animals, but the center may also have just forgotten about the other eight. And so, if we see those discrepancies, we still need to contact the center and just ask them to make sure that everything that's uploaded is complete. Uh, and also, sometimes the centers will accidentally mark it complete without forgetting to, forgetting to upload the data, and so it'll do those kinds of things. Now, the automated script does uh, fairly good, but when you're looking more closely at the data, you can actually have a lot of things that uh, you need to ask about that, have, that, the, that the automated script can't deal with. And so those are a, a series of manual curation flags that we have developed uh, to try to minimize uh, those kinds of errors. And so, for example, this particular flag is a strain nomenclature is not consistent with the order. So, for example, the order set a knockout, but everything that was uploaded was, um, was a, a, um, in, a, a background inbred strain, for example. And so, uh, we just need to find out what's going on. Uh, the mouse metadata is inconsistent between the experiment and the control app. Um, or there was a drug administration that's not consistent with the order. So, the, drug, so the order said they were going to do A, but they uploaded B. And so, we need to find out. Or they said that there was a drug, but there's no experimental condition that tells us what the drug was. And so those are the kinds of things we look for. Uh, mouse diets aren't consistent with the order. The order said they were going to do a high-fat diet, but the diet that was uploaded is not a high-fat diet. That's kind of thing. So our curators, we look very carefully at the data to make sure that it's as complete as we can make it and that uh, all the information is captured so that uh, in the future, someone will be able to at least interpret how the data was collected. So we can use these flags throughout the system to do searches. Um, the data curators, um, to maintain provenance, um, we also allow comments to be attached to these curation flags. So if you see a curation flag that's grayed out, that means it's been resolved. And the way it gets in, so for example, all comments are tagged and they're never taken away. Comments are only appended. So if uh, another comment needs to be made, they can just click the icon. It'll bring up a little box they can type in their comment and they can say update. And then that will be tracked with that particular experiment. Uh, 
and the way the curator interacts with the sensors is there's a little uh, icon that pops up on her on her view of the world. Uh, if she needs to contact the center because there's a discrepancy that she's trying to understand, uh, she just clicks that, a little window pops up, and she can add the custom test and what exactly issues she's concerned about. Now, the centers can also run these little queries to see where, they're, where they are with respect to clearing the different curation flags. Uh, and basically, all the query does is these are all the different flags that are possible. The first column are the total number of flags for that particular curation flag. The second column are the cleared flags, meaning they've interacted with our curator, we've uh, made a decision, and uh, they've been cleared. And then the last flag, or the last uh, column is just all the flags that remain that need to be resolved. And so that's how we keep track of the curation flow and just make sure that everything in the system is as complete as possible. Okay, so the big, because this data is so heterogeneous, uh, we've always had trouble as trying to understand how can we use this data uh, and, and display it to the public that might be useful and to help them with their scientific endeavors. And so we came up with a strategy that we basically took from the IMPC group uh, on how they tag uh, their data sets with mammalian phenotype terms uh, to try to understand uh, the knockout genes, uh, what, what phenotypes are perturbed by their knockout genes. Uh, and so they use a, a library that they created called FENSTAT, um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, when an experiment status is set to complete, it goes through our whole curation workflow, but at some point, the curator is going to say, okay, the curation is complete. And once that happens, uh, the data set is now available to be analyzed uh, internally by our systems using the FENSTAT library. So the data curator can then run a, uh, a statistical analysis on the data set, uh, and they can generate that. And once they are generated it, uh, if, there, if everything works and there's no errors and everything seems to be fine, uh, she can then mark it as complete. And then that tells my biostatistician that he needs to review that uh, analysis before, uh, we bear, uh, before we release it to the public. Uh, so our biostatistician will then review the analysis that was done by the curator. And if he thinks it was done correctly, he will verify the analysis, and then, this, then that will be stored in the system. Uh, if he thinks there's a problem, he will then contact the curator, and those two will work out uh, the proper analysis uh, that needs to be done for that particular data set. And uh, once, he's, once they've um, verified it, he will then mark that data set as verified. And then once that happens, there is an automatic script that runs on the data set that then assigns mammalian phenotype terms based on a statistical analysis. So what are the FENSTAT libraries? So these were libraries that were developed a few years ago from the IMPC group um, to analyze their data because they, they were in the same position as us. They have these large uh, phenotyping centers and they're dumping their data in there and they needed some script that could then analyze the data quickly and then assign mammalian phenotype terms. And so uh, this particular library does a very good job of data set checking and cleaning and terminology unification. It has a variety of statistical functions for both continuous and categorical data. And then it outputs the data in both a human read readable format as well as a vector format that's good for dumping into database tables and things like that. So uh, it was a, it was a, a, a very good uh, library for us, but the only problem was uh, so, for example, for the mixed model analysis, uh, it only provided uh, four types of equations. You could only look for uh, covariates of weight and batch effect um, with uh, these, with these uh, four uh, equations. You could look for sex by strain interactions and things like that, but it would only allow you to account for batch and weight effects. And the problem with the MMPC data is it's much more complicated than that. So if, you're, if you have a variation in diet for a drug, or something like that. There's a number of covariates that would have to be incorporated into the into the uh, model uh, in order for us to analyze the data. And so um, we set about these these uh, libraries were available through GitHub. So we downloaded them and then we modified them so that we could analyze uh, the MMPC data for them. The other the other thing these uh, libraries by default assume there's only two strains in any comparison. And we have many, many, many experiments where we have more than two strains that are being uh, analyzed at a time. So we set about and we analyzed, uh, so we set about to modify these so that we could use them. Uh, and we did complete that. Um, they are not available. They're still on the private side of GitHub, but we will be releasing them out to the public through GitHub.
but we call it FinSet MMPC. Uh, we're constantly testing these because the data sets are, like I said, very heterogeneous, and we come across data sets that the current library can't analyze, and so we have to do modifications uh, on a regular basis to kind of make sure that we can analyze our data sets. So right now we can analyze 90 for, not about 95% of the data sets, uh, and the way it works is the MMPC generates a data file, uh, and then we have what we call is a schema file, and the schema file basically defines how the analysis will be done, what co which, uh, which um, variables are the covariates, whether you're gonna do a mixed model, is it a time course experiment, those kinds of things. And so we developed our calling code uh, that takes those two files and actually runs the analysis, uh, and then it uh, stores that into our system. So the current FENSTAT MMPC library, uh, it handles more than one covariate, it handles time course data, it handles more than two mouse strains, and it handles batch effects. Um, one of the things we were concerned about that we are modifying these libraries, so we want to make sure that we haven't uh, done something uh, by accident and the analysis isn't correct. So just to confirm it, we've taken many uh, MMPC data sets, uh, analyzed them in FENSTAT MMPC, and then ran the exact same data set for the exact same analysis in SAS and compared the results, and they always come out identical, well, to a certain significant number of figures. Okay. So how does that work? So as I said, once the curation is marked as complete, a little fence that button appears uh, in the uh, experiment page. The curator can then push that, and then they essentially have, it's a very straightforward process. Uh, what type of analysis is gonna be done? What comparisons are gonna be made? What assays or measurements are going to be used in this? Are there any batch weight or covariates that need to be assessed? So for example, this one mouse diet is being checked here. And then once we run the analysis, it then produces a result, and this is the FENSTAT result page. So I know it's kind of small, but, but the top of the page basically gives you all the experimental factors that were in this particular experiment. So in this particular one, there was two different diets being compared uh, between the two, uh, between the strains. Uh, we also maintain provenance. So the original data that was analyzed that produced these statistical results is, is up here, by, if you just click this. The schema file that told you how we did the analysis is also maintained, and the original output file uh, for the FENSTAT MMPC output is also maintained. And you, this is completely accessible to everybody. So if they click on the data file, a little window pops up and you can see exactly what it was used for the analysis. If you want to download it to your local computer and do your own analysis, you just click the little CSV and it'll let you download that to, the, to your local system and you can do whatever you need to with it. Um, the uh, the uh, FENSTAT um, overview uh, is, so because there can be multiple strains, there can be multiple comparisons, we try to design an interface that would allow you to, at a quick, at a glance, see which uh, results were significant and which ones were not. And so uh, these are all the measurements are down here, and if they're coded green, that means there are significant, statistically significant results associated with that. Um, the tabs are, are there for multiple uh, strains. And so you can see for this particular experiment, the A versus C and A versus D are not statistically significant, whereas the A versus B are. And so you just have to look at these columns. You can see which comparisons are being made. Uh, it provides you information on the number of animals uh, that were analyzed. And here is the mean and standard deviation for each of those uh, values for whatever it is that you're looking at. So it gives you a quick way to kind of look at the, the analysis, and this is the, the statistical output uh, from FENSTAT. Okay, so we've uh, done our analysis, and now what we need to do is assign these MP terms. Uh, so we do that by assigning MP terms to the assays themselves. And so the way that works is you click in here, and we can, uh, so for example, lean body mass uh, is the assay, and we can look at what MP terms are associated with lean body mass, and it's these three terms. Uh, we can then, uh, select those and then submit them to the system, and now those are associated with that assay. So if there are statistically significant uh, results for lean body mass, then we then go through a decision tree to decide how to assign uh, MP terms. And we take into consideration gender, and we also take into consideration uh, sex by gender interaction, I mean sex by strain interactions as well. Um, and basically the MP terms are assigned uh, based on the statistical output for the uh, FENSTAT MMPC. Okay, so how do we put this all together now and use this in a data search? 
I say. So the data search page is a very simple page, and you just ask a simple question, what would you like to search for? And we have three possibilities. You can search by gene, you can search by phenotype, and or you can search by catalog item. So for example, if I want to select a particular gene, in this case, I selected A, B, C, B4, um, it then pulls all the experiments in the system that have significant results uh, for that particular gene. Um, it then uh, also provides the MP terms that are assigned, and the MP terms are color-coded. So all the terms that are in blue are the, all the terms that are an increased phenotype. Uh, all the terms in red are decreased phenotypes. And all the terms in yellow are abnormal phenotypes. Okay. Um, so just to kind of look a little closer, uh, we use tooltips significantly throughout the entire site. So hovering your mouse over the strain will pop up a little uh, box that explain that, that has a description of that strain for you. Um, if you hover over the assay, it does the same thing. It'll tell you information about that particular assay. Uh, this is the p-value and effect size that was observed uh, for this particular assay. Uh, and then if you hover over the MP term, it'll also provide information about that MP term. And if you actually click on that, it'll take you to the Jackson Laboratory site uh, where they have the MP term definitions and things like that. Now, um, so let me go back. So uh, you may be interested in what phenotypes are associated with this particular gene. So if you come over to the, uh, the filter search region that gets generated based on this and based on this search, if you click in the phenotype section, it will list all the phenotypes that were pulled from that uh, particular gene or from those experiments that use that gene manipulation. Uh, and if you want to filter the data for a particular phenotype, you just can click on the little checkbox there next to it and it will automatically filter all the data for that particular phenotype. Okay, if you click on, so if you click on the uh, assay, it will also take you to the FENSTAT results and then allows you to see uh, exactly what was done and how much uh, and what the significance was. So in this case, it was a P of 0.017 for the significant value. If I was interested in phenotypes, um, you can search in very broad terms. And so if I was looking for anything that had the word body in it, I could just type the body and it will bring up all those. And I may be interested in uh, a decreased lean body mass. So if I click that and hit search, it's gonna automatically pull all the experiments in the system that have decreased lean body mass. Um, and uh, again, it'll be the same format. Uh, if I wanted to see what genes were pulled that were associated with decreased lean body mass. I could just click in here and it will show me all the genes. And if I want to filter specifically on a gene, I can just click that here and it will automatically filter the data set. If I was interested in what other phenotypes uh, were associated uh, with decreased lean body mass, I can pull all the phenotypes that were also returned when I did this query. And so, for example, if I was interested in hypoactivity, uh, and to, to see which um, experiments had both decreased lean body mass and hypoactivity, all I would have to do is click that and it will automatically refilter the data set for those two uh, phenotypes. So how can you use this kind of, oh, sorry. Uh, and then finally, uh, for the catalog items, if you're looking for data for a particular catalog item, say energy expenditure and clams or indirect calorimetry, all you have to do is select whatever it is that your catalog item you're looking for, and it will pull all the experiments that have used that catalog item to generate their data. Okay, so how might I use this if I want to um, look at a particular uh, combination of phenotypes, because it might be very interesting um, for um, uh, discovery. And so, for example, one of the use cases that, that came across was uh, this individual was uh, making the comment that, you know, lean body mass and fat body mass tend to go in the same direction. So if one's going up, the other's also going up, or if one's going down, the other's also going down. And so the question was, are there any data sets in your system that have them in the opposite direction? So if I'm going to uh, increase uh, lean body mass, are there examples where there's decreased fat mass uh, in the system? And so it's what, the way you would do that query, uh, is you would first start with one of the phenotypes, in this case, increased lean body mass. Uh, and then what you would do is you would come over to the phenotype uh, terms that were, that were returned, and if decreased body fat mass was in those terms, then that means there are experiments that have both of those uh, in there. And so then you can just select them, uh, select the uh, decreased body fat, uh, body fat mass. It will then refilter the data to have both of those terms in it. 
uh, and then uh, you can start to look at what experiments um, have those two terms uh, in them. And so just to kind of give you an idea, uh, this particular experiment is a fat-specific knockout uh, for the raptor gene, um, and it had a positive effect size uh, for lean body mass. Um, so if we now click on the lean body mass, it then takes you to the FENSTAT results, and you can see that in here it was an increase in lean body mass at a P of 0.014. Uh, if you click on the fat body mass, you can then see that this is a pretty significant drop. It went from 12 to 2. It's about a 140% uh, change uh, in fat mass at a P of uh, negative 4. And it has an effect size of negative 10.5. So it's a way for um, you to query our system uh, for combinations of phenotypes that may be of interest to you. OK. So finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're trying to do with the DKNet in integrating this MMPC data to try to make it more useful uh, to other uh, in investigators who uh, may not necessarily uh, be looking at the MMPC data itself, but hopefully uh, providing information uh, that would help uh, in the future. So working with DKNet and their hypothesis center uh, using the Signal and Pathways project that um, uh, was done by Neil McKenna, uh, we are now in the process of working with uh, Neil and uh, Jeff to integrate the MMPC data into the DKNet Hypothesis Center. Uh, the Signaling Pathways Project is a knowledge base of um, consensomes, essentially tra consensus transcriptomics across multiple experiments. Uh, they did a, a large uh, meta-analysis um, across uh, a large bio-curated omics data point. Uh, and the idea is that it helps uh, put connections between genomic targets and their upstream regulatory pathways and disease states. And trying to uh, provide a way to um, look at these transcriptomic data across multiple experiments uh, and using that as evidence for particular signaling pathways that may have genes that are perturbed uh, in those pathways. And so uh, this was a slide provided by Neil McKenna, and these are the data sets that are in uh, the SPP project. Uh, for the transcriptomic work, they use expression array and RNA-seq data from the gene expression omnibus, uh, and they have imported both mouse, human, and rat data across these different uh, data types. Uh, for the chit-seq data, they came, that came from the SRA, and this has both mouse and human uh, data sets. Now, the, one of the main uh, products of the sig uh, signaling pathways projects are consensomes. Um, and these are lists of genes that are ranked uh, according to the meta-analysis of their differential expression in these archived transcriptomic data sets, okay? And so the idea here is that these are ranked uh, genes based on a specific pathways, for example, or, or tissues, um, and that they might help you guide, to guide you to identifying genes that are consistently impacted by a given pathway in a given tissue context. And so, uh, Neil and I uh, started thinking about this. How could we use the MMPC data to help uh, with the SPP project? And so one of the first questions we thought of was, can data from the MMPC provide experimental evidence to support genes in these consensomes? And so uh, the first thing we tried as a proof of principle uh, was we looked at the consensome for mouse adipose tissue, and there's 26,277 genes in that. And we simply asked a, a basic question. So if we search the MMPC for phenotypes for bo uh, body fat mass, uh, what genes are, are, are produced? And of those genes, how many of them are in the top 10% uh, of the consensome? In other words, they're in the 90th percentile. And so when we did that search, we found there was 22 genes uh, in the MMPC that had uh, these designations. And 11 of those were in the top 10% or the 90th percentile. Uh, for that particular consensome for adipose tissue. And it was sort of arguing that those 11 genes may have some effect on uh, fat. And so what we decided, what we wanted needed to do was, um, so uh, to assess the enrichment for that uh, and calculate the p-values, we used a hypergeometric distribution. And as it turned out, there's about a 4.9 or almost a five-fold enrichment uh, for genes associated with fat mass with a p of negative uh, six. Um, and so it looked, that's actually a, a pretty respectable enrichment for genes that may have an effect on adipose tissue. Uh, and so to do a comparison, we thought, well, let's look at the IMPC data. 
Uh, there was 480 genes, 85 of which were in the 90th percentile, which gave us an enrichment of about 1.7. Uh, we then went to the MGI and looked at uh, abnormal adipose tissue physiology. There was 146 genes in that data set, 60 of which were in the 90th percentile, which gave us an enrichment of about fourfold. Uh, and then we just asked the GO terms, um, how many GO terms uh, had fat cell differentiation, and that had about a 3.6 fold enrichment. So it looked like, it does look like the MMPC data may be able to be used uh, to help uh, support, have that, uh, experimental evidence to support a particular. A gene in a consensome that might affect the tissue of interest. In this case, we're looking at adipose tissue. And so uh, what Neil uh, did was he wanted to first uh, ask the question, well, we have this adipose, uh, consent, adipose tissue consensome. Is there evidence that uh, it actually is enriched in genes that deal with uh, uh, fat cell differentiation? So he took the GO terms, all the genes that had a GO term of fat cell differentiation, and just ask a simple question, what's the median uh, consensus p-value and the median uh, percentile that for those sets of genes? And it's in the 85th percentile with the consensus p-value of minus eight, uh, which is significantly enriched uh, relative to the overall consensome uh, for adipose tissue. Meaning that we probably, that the, um, the uh, genes that are with elevated rankings in the consensome are probably enriched uh, for genes that have a functional role and adipocyte development. But what was interesting was while he was looking at that, he noticed there was FBOX31, uh, which uh, no one has, uh, uh, to this date at least, um, associated with uh, changes in fat or adipose tissue. Uh, it, had, it was in the 95th percentile with a consensus p-value of 10 to the minus 14, but it was also one of the 11 genes in the 90th percentile that had data from the MMPC. And so the thought was, well, maybe this is some uh, experimental evidence that this gene may actually have some impact on uh, adipose tissue. Uh, that particular study uh, was by Michael Green, and here's what he was looking at. He wasn't even looking at fat, uh, per se, he was looking at P53 levels, uh, but they were measuring um, uh, fat mass uh, as part of their uh, metabolic phenotyping. Um, and if you look at the fat mass, you can see that there was an, an increase in fat mass at a P of 0 0.001. And so it does appear there may be some um, uh, experimental evidence to support that FBOX31 may have something uh, to do with adipose tissue. Now, the big caveat that we have to make sure is this is only one experiment uh, in our system. It was the only experiment that, that, was, that was using this FBOX31, and it was just this one investigator. And so uh, as we were thinking about this, we thought, well, in order for us to try to uh, help, uh, we may need to come up with some sort of confidence metric uh, that would allow us to um, attach this MMPC data to the SPP. So, for example, you can imagine if I had 10 um, uh, experiments from different investigators all giving me the same uh, information, I have probably have much more confidence than if I have just one experiment for that. And so the final thoughts on this is that the MMPC centers can provide fee-for-service phenotyping of live mice over a broad range of research areas. Uh, it's highly curated data and available to the public. Uh, we can, we, you can search our data uh, based on gene, phenotype, or catalog items. Uh, and right now, we're trying to work on integrating these data with the SPP data at, at DKNet to increase the range of uses for the data. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you. So um, if you have questions, you can unmute now. And there is one question. Um, who can use the test service? Do they need to be, uh, do I need to be a consortium member or it's open to anyone? Anyone. Anyone can, anyone can um, request MMPC services. By and large, I'd say the vast, vast majority of our clients are from the United States, but occasionally we do get uh, requests from outside the U.S., but almost everybody's from the inside. Because trying to uh, trying to ship live mice internationally is kind of tricky. Okay. Um, if you have question, you can send um, Rick email or send email to DKNet, and we can forward the questions. Um, thanks sure. for Dr. Makinda for the great presentation, and thanks for everyone for joining today's webinar.